This is a story about pioneers. There's going to be no way there's not an hit chapter when they get around to writing the history of interactive entertainment. Every title that they release becomes a reference standard for the industry. Demon Killing. You're a space marine fighting your way to and through hell and back. Incredible graphics. The new engine for Doom 3, it's really revolutionary in the fact that it gives us the power to really create just about anything that we can imagine. They're just sitting there sometimes with their mouth open, just going, this is incredible. And a legendary gaming franchise. If you're going to list now the top five franchises in video gaming history, Doom's going to be on the list. Every gamer on the planet right now wants to get their hands on Doom 3. This is the history of Doom. It's May 5th, 1991, and a small company in Mesquite, Texas called id Software makes a big impact with Wolfenstein 3D. It was not the first 3D game. It was not even id's first 3D game. But it was the first 3D game to really hit a, a, a national and even international audience. And it was only a way that had impact. People weren't ready for it games that to this point really hadn't looked anything like Wolfenstein did and uh, compared to today's standards that's not that great but at the time this was just a, a, a revolution. Wolfenstein 3D was the first real good example of id growing into a role as the originator of a genre and feeling confident about their humor level and their their talent level and uh, really you know unloading a lot of those skills on, uh, on the genre they invented. But Wolfenstein is just a warm-up. On December 10th 1993 id Software releases an even even bigger blockbuster, Doom. The original Doom was really good because it was kind of the first game that kind of gave everyone a glimpse to the future of what games, you know, would be like. Deathmatch was an id terminology. The word probably existed beforehand, but was popularized by Doom. When people talk about frags and, and all the other terminologies, they're hearkening back to things that were set in place by Doom. We enjoyed the jump to uh, the more kind of horror action with Doom. And of course, it was also driven by what we were watching at the time. Doom was always about aliens and evil dead. There is no real way, to my knowledge, to estimate how many people have downloaded and played Doom Shareware. I think you could make a very, very good argument that Doom was probably the most played computer game of all time, just because of all the people who downloaded it for free. Doom will rack up more than 10 million downloads in its lifetime. It follows up with Doom 2 one year later, but then takes a break from the franchise to release Quake in 1996. Quake in its day was an absolutely phenomenal engine to debut with. It was just raw technology that you would look at and say, we haven't seen anything like this on the PC before. And then uh, they took it a step further. It was actually brilliant fun to play in multiplayer and really created the multiplayer shooter as a, as a phenomenon event. id Software's games in general appeal to fans because they put out next generation technology with their new big games. And they're able for PC gamers to take gaming where it hasn't been before. I was certainly a strong advocate of getting good 3D acceleration in early on and we went out of our way to do some of the early things like the, the rendition version of Quake, the original GL Quake being freely released. ID continues to push the boundaries of technology with the release of Quake 2 in December 1997 and Quake 3 Arena in 1999. Quake was central in convincing every serious PC gamer you had to have at least a decent 3D card and preferably the latest and greatest. Really the big thing was when we went to Quake 3 requiring hardware acceleration on there and that was again a, a somewhat gutsy move at the time because there had been a few hardware only games but they had been these small niche products that generally hadn't been very successful. But once you were past that hurdle you, you were never going back and, and PC gaming changed forever because that was the only way to play a shooter if you were serious at all. And and Quake 3 was looked at in a lot of people's eyes as a bellwether of is this going to be okay to do this at this time and while Quake 3 wasn't our largest success it was certainly a big enough success that everybody looked at and said
that, yeah, you could still take advantage of the hardware features and still be very successful. Every title that they release becomes a reference standard for the industry. It raises the bar once again. Id Software is ready to start its next game, but the small developer must first face its inner demons. The new millennium is just around the corner, and Id Software is going through some birthing pains. Every project for the last couple ones we had been considering, well, you know, is it time to, to remake Doom with new technology and all that? At the end of Quake 3, we did have a little bit of an internal spat over where we were going with the next project. Uh, the only kind of foregone conclusion was that it was going to be single-player focused because there was a good contingent in the company that wasn't happy with the Quake 3 kind of activity level of gameplay. We wanted to really create this scary, intense, action-packed horror game. And everybody is much more afraid when they're alone. But there was still debate over exactly what we were going to do. And it did come down to a point where, you know, we had a big forced issue about it where I wasn't at all comfortable with the alternate project that was being pushed on there. And it wasn't clear that we could come up with a clear unified company direction on something brand new and every project for the last couple ones we had been considering well you know is it time to, to remake Doom with new technology. John when he was doing research on what the next generation of technology for mid was going to be came to the conclusion that he was going to be able to realize sort of the vision that he had in his mind's eye when he came up with the original idea for Doom in that we could use and leverage that technology to really create this intense action horror game and make a really scary version of Doom. Originally I was, uh, I was opposed to the idea. I was, I was a bit concerned that uh, the team that we had, which was a bit in transition, uh, wasn't going to be able to really push Doom in a, in a direction to sort of live up to the title. So I just kind of made that the stand and said, now's the time we can do some really radically better stuff with new technology now. In hindsight, my opposition was, was absolutely wrong. The decision was great. Bringing back Doom is an exceptional challenge. We've got Dark Star, you are set for lockdown. Welcome back. If there was a Hall of Fame in computer gaming, I can say with all the humility in the world that there's absolutely a place at the top or certainly near it for, for Doom and Doom 2. And, you know, there's almost a reluctance to go back and mess with the formula, you know, almost like, you know, a Hall of Fame running back coming out of retirement. Is he going to just sort of destroy his legacy? Doing Doom 3 is a very tall order because Doom was such a, such a mega successful game that uh, um, we really had to evaluate what we wanted to do. What do our fans really want us to bring back from the original? And then what can we add to the new Doom 3 to make it, you know, so much better? You have a game that people become so it becomes a part of their life and they spend so many hours playing with it they almost develop some some sense of a relationship with the game itself that they have some ownership of it and so they feel like that they almost have you know some say in in how the game ought to be taken going forward because hey look i played this game for you know a thousand hours of my life people get obsessive with everything that comes out of it people are obsessive about it it's games are great. One of the reasons people respect it is that it never turns its back on quality. Everything that comes out is going to be good. People get so emotionally attached and then they get afraid of, well, if it's not the exact game or if it's, if it's not as good or better, if it's not their interpretation of what the next game ought to be like and they get afraid that we're going to do something different with it. They, you know, they don't want to see the next game come out because they just want to sort of freeze time and have Doom be the way it was when, you know, they had all these great experiences in their life and don't want to have anything to sort of, to sort of spoil that memory. We definitely understand, you know, people's emotional attachment to the, to the properties because we feel it too, uh, and, and at least as strong as they do. On June 1st, 2000, work begins on making Doom 3 a worthy successor to the legendary franchise. It's the new millennium, and id Software is hard at work on Doom 3. The first year of Doom, after I had laid down the very basic technology, I was always saying that there's kind of like a, 
a tripod of features and technology that's going to make Doom what it is. There's the unified lighting and shadowing. There's the more complex animation and scripting, which will show off that lighting and shadowing on there. And then there's the GUI surfaces, which add the extra level of interactivity to the game. And all of those really proved out correct. The new engine, you know, for Doom 3 is just, it's really revolutionary in the fact that it gives us the power to really create just about anything that we can imagine. Okay, there's a few things we need to take care of first. And id pieces together the game's new storyline with the help of science fiction writer Matthew Costello. We actually contracted a professional science fiction writer to help us with the story. That was a first for id. He left you no choice. True. But this is the last time. After we laid the basic story foundation down, we storyboarded all the action. That also was the first for id. We knew we wanted to take the the Doom story, the original Doom story, and the Doom environment, and sort of bring that into uh, the future. Amazing things will happen here soon. You just wait. The story in Doom uh, takes place as if the first two never happened. So it's, it's very important that fans realize that this is not Doom 3, you know, after Doom 2 Hell on Earth. This is Doom 3, whereas Doom and Doom 2 never happened. And so we knew we had those elements to, to work with, like uh, the uh, UAC, a uh, research facility, uh, Martian landscape. The player is back on Mars, and uh, the UAC is conducting some super secret teleportation technology. UAC scientists have made discoveries that will forever change human existence. Then something went terribly wrong. Through some miscalculations and some arrogance, the, uh, the UAC opens a portal to hell. When we started um, thinking about what direction to go with that, uh, we looked at different movies that we felt like that would uh, portray those demonic elements, monster elements, the Martian landscape, uh, the weapons that we felt we'd have, things like that. We've really kind of taken a new approach on the old story. We've answered some questions like, where did the UAC come up with the technology? You know, what's the demon's motivation? I mean, we we really expanded all of those aspects and made a really, you know, uh, engrossing story. And some old enemies make a return, along with a few new surprises. With the ultra-realistic looking you know, textures and monsters, we could bring those original demons that people love so much from, from Doom back, you know, with just larger-than-life quality. There's quite a few little elements that have popped up here and there uh, in, uh, in Doom 3. There's a number of, of textures from uh, little tech textures or... Uh, some evil wall textures or satanic symbols and things like that. The original Doom demons are very classic in, thems in themselves. We knew that we had to bring the great ones back, like the Cyber Demon and the, and, uh, and the Pinky Demon. We decided which ones we wanted to bring back, and then Ken Scott took those and started to draw the newer, updated versions in concept art. The imp character people remember from the original Doom, the uh, Caco Demon, which is that big well, it's like a big strawberry in the original Doom. He's quite a bit more scary in Doom 3. But besides bringing back the, some of the original classics, we actually came up with some new ones and some brand new fresh demons that, uh, that no one's ever seen before. But gamers won't be facing these demons empty-handed. All of the weapons from the original Doom are in Doom 3. And uh, we've added a few new ones. It's a good feeling to bring up that Doom shotgun, bust open a door, and go into a room with demons. So I think fans of the original will, will definitely appreciate that. In 2001, Doom is revealed to the public for the first time at Macworld in Tokyo. But the game makes an even bigger splash when id Software takes it to E3 in 2002. The year that Doom 3 came out, people couldn't sit still. You would come out, you would tell people about what you would see, how real it looked, how it was maybe Shrek quality animation and graphics. And they'd look at you blank faced because there was no way it could be real. We had a 15 minute in-game kind of demo play. And we had seats and it was a little dark and uh, uh, it really kind of made the fans realize 
that uh, the game's scary, that, that the game has movie quality, that, you know, it's over-the-top action. Uh, it really it really helped kind of deliver the message that, you know, what, what Doom, you know, was. Everybody knew what Doom, the original Doom was, but they, they never knew what direction that we were taking with Doom 3. And this gave us the opportunity to show that direction. When it went out there and it just had this amazing reception on there, you know, they're just sitting there sometimes with their mouth open, just going, this is incredible. People didn't believe it was real. The E3 judges, they had to come up to us and say, okay, would you like to go try it? Or would you like to see us play it so we can prove to you that this is not a fake, this is a real thing? We received great feedback. We won five awards that year at, at E3. It was, uh, it was a fantastic E3 for us. But just as id Software returns from a triumphant E3 showing, the unthinkable happens. Not long after E3 2002 wraps up with a phenomenal showing for Doom, a leaked version of id's new project appears on the internet. We would get mail from people saying, I played the demo and it had all these problems. Whatever, it's not a demo, it was a stolen leaked executable. The notorious sort of Doom 3 Alpha wasn't really even an Alpha at all. It was actually a build of the game that had been built up for E3 that I'm not exactly sure how it got out. People got a hold of that and of course, you know, it began to distribute over the internet. We'd obviously prefer that something like that never happen, but it doesn't really hurt us that much. Uh, it's a distraction when we have to worry about running damage control and spinning some of the issues in there. Today we can look back on it and uh, as bad as it seemed at the time is, is that we've certainly been able, able to overcome. But I don't think that there's going to be anybody that got a hold of that for some reason that won't buy the game because they saw that. You know, it's just, it's obviously too far away, too much of it has changed since then. Id forges ahead, making advances in a new area. They took my baby. <laughs> Audio in our games has always been, uh, you know, clearly second fiddle to rendering. But as computers have gotten faster and faster, that couple percent that we devote to audio has gotten more and more capable. One thing that we've done in Doom 3 that's, that's very cool is we have a true six channel uh, surround sound. And that gives us the ability to have sound and audio cues that happen around the player. So like, for instance, if, if a demon is sneaking up behind you, you can hear them. You're walking through a dark corridor and you hear whispers that circle you. It really kind of gets the player into the game because they're like in a, a wave of sound. And Chris Brenna, the former drummer for Nine Inch Nails, is brought in to lend his talent to the music in Doom 3. In Doom 3, the music is a little bit different than what we've done in previous titles. Usually, uh, what we had is like a soundtrack that loop throughout the entire level or area that you're in. But in Doom 3, what we try to do is kind of make the world around you almost musical in its ambient sense. It's all kind of very, very different, very fluid. Uh, you know, very, uh, uh, you know, changing and, and unique. Its new game is also being developed for the Xbox. The original core rendering decisions for Doom were influenced very specifically by the capabilities of the Xbox. We knew at the time what the Xbox was going to be like coming out, and uh, the rendering of what we do with geometry and surfaces and textures and all that was crafted around something that was going to be efficient on the Xbox. One of the great things about the Xbox is the technology in the Xbox uh, is very similar to you know the technology that John looked at when he architected the, the engine. So all the features that you see in the PC version will be in the Xbox version. The dynamic lights, the physics, the bump mapping. Now, of course, there will be things that are different, but I believe that people that don't have a PC that have an Xbox will still be able to enjoy what the PC people will be, will be raving about. Doom 3 is shown again at E3 in 2003 and 2004. Each time it appears, attendees are awed. Work on the game begins to wrap up. I'm sure it's going to be a huge release when everything gets out here, but everyone, everyone should be really looking forward to getting the game out on the shelves because uh, the response should be just really phenomenal. Every gamer on the planet right now wants to get their hands on Doom 3. What I've been most proud of in Doom is the way that the technology's all kind of come together and really provided a seamless experience, whether you're playing the game, searching 
fighting the monsters or interacting with the GUIs. It's all come together to be a very nice kind of seamless package for the player. The thing that makes me the happiest is when people come to it, they play the game and they say, you know what, that was great. It was better than I thought it was going to be. And before Doom 3 is even out the door, the team at id is already looking to the future. We have decided we're not going to go back and do a Doom 4 or another Quake game, which is, you know, Quake 4 is already in development at Raven, and uh, Return to Castle Wolfenstein, basically the, the sequel to that is, is a project that's, that's already in the works at another studio as well. Um, so our, our job will be making something new, and we've decided we're going to do a new, a new IP, a new brand for id. After any project, I've usually got a pretty big list of technologies to explore. You know, there's other just wild research ideas that I'm going to be pursuing on there. The next project is actually already in the works. You know, we have uh, some rough ideas. You know, we started on some, some very simple concept art. Uh, we are a small team. You know, we make games the same business. And that's what we need to do. So we will start on the next title relatively quickly. I think 20 years from now, we're going to look back at it as being a fundamental source for all that is great about interactive entertainment and that there's going to be no way that there's not an id chapter when they get around to writing the history of interactive entertainment.